And then during the Depression, there were 15 million people sleeping in every empty lot. That's a lot of people. What happened is they bought houses and cars and the banks fell. Do you know about They closed down. And they couldn't get their own money out, so they were kicked out of the buildings they bought. And they were sleeping in every empty lot, millions of Americans. And I looked around, and the stores had everything in the windows, you know, radios in those days, whatever people would need, but they had no money. So then I thought, there's something wrong with our system. You know, how can this happen in this country? I didn't have any answers, but there were people up on soapboxes talking about Mankind United, a new organization, technocracy, socialism, communism. Every park, every, bar, every university, kids were talking about social change because conditions were bad. See, that brought them around to it. So uh, at that time, I, hitchhike, I was going to hitchhike to Florida for other reasons because the winter was so cold, we didn't have heat. And I had to get to Florida, so in hitchhiking toward Florida, when I I saw an old man walking with all his worldly goods on his shoulder, you know, on a, they call him a bindle stiff. That's an impoverished person with all his worldly goods in a blanket, and he was shuffling very slow. So I called out to him. I wanted to help him carry that load, but he can hardly walk. But I called out several times. He was also hard of hearing. And he turned around and he had acromegalia. You know what that is? Elephant man disease. His face was all distorted. And as a kid, I didn't know what that was. And I was kind of shocked by that. And I kept hitchhiking till I got into, I think it was Savannah, Georgia. And I went to the local police station. And I said, I have no place to sleep. Can I sleep in a jail? They said, only if we fingerprint you. Well, since I didn't, didn't commit any crimes, I said, sure, go ahead. Then they put me in this jail with a dull red light. I must have been about 16 or so. And uh, uh, the toilet bowl had shit all over it. It was filthy. There's no place to sleep. It was dirty. So I just sat in the corner and looked at that red light. It was so depressing, you know. And then I heard moaning in the next cell. And I looked in, there was this dull red light. There was this guy with acromegalia, the old man, with a distorted face, who couldn't speak. So I banged on the bars of the prison, and a trustee came over. He said, what do you want? I said, this old man belongs in a hospital, not prison. I said, he said, no good bum. These people seem to have no humanity at all, none. So I said, he belongs in the hospital. Well, ah, shut up. And he went away. Then I left the next day, and I met another kid my age, about 16 or so, and we both continued together. And uh, the guy drove up in a fairly new-looking car, and he said, would you kid like to make a buck? So the kid that I was with said, I'd like to make a buck. What do you want me to do? So I want you to tell my girlfriend I can't see her Saturday. I'll be occupied. And so she'll give you a package for me. So what the note said, I found out later, the girl was a cashier at a movie theater. And the note that the kid gave to the girl was, if you don't give the kid all the money you've got there, we'll blow your head off. We've got guns aimed at you. So the guy was using this kid. And this kid didn't know what the hell it was about. So the woman screamed, and the police came and took the kid away. I had nothing I could do. I was in rags myself, you know. And I remember saying in my own head, boy, this shit's got to go. There's no such thing as justice or anything. You know, I realized that as a kid. I was alone, had no power at all. And then I continued to hitchhike on toward Florida. And in Florida, they had, under Roosevelt administration, transit camp. That's for wild boys of the road. They weren't wild, they were just kids that had no place to go. Their families were dispossessed. We're moving in that direction now again. We're not there yet. And it was uh, those conditions that helped me understand.
you give a lot of static from your friends. It's human nature. Humans have no nature. Depends on where they're brought up. Every book written in this culture is culture bound. It has nothing to do with reality. It's where this culture is. So what I'm going to try to tell you is that 90% of what you've been brought up to believe in is strictly bullshit. So when I was a kid, I want to know what men and women would be like if they weren't too contaminated by civilization. So I worked my way on a boat to Tahiti, but the Chinese already owned all the businesses there. They had business out of the stores, and that was already contaminated. So I found some out islands called Tuamoto. When I was on the islands, I brought mirrors and beads. I was going to give them to the natives to show I come as a friend, not to take anything away from them. But they were already in my thatched hut after I built it, giving out my mirrors and beads to one another without my permission. And I was a little confused. <laughs> so I said, well, what's going on here? And they said, you have too many. I really did have <laughs> I really didn't understand it because I was a jerk brought up in a civilized country. But about three days later, I did understand it. The older men were pulling in nets full of fish, and they threw fish at anyone standing. Not you or me, but you or me, three, but they just threw fish. And coconuts were so available, and bananas, that nobody sold anything, they just gave me things. After I was on the island a while, I asked the natives if they would help me build an outrigger canoe. I know how to build one better than they do, but I wanted to establish you know, my colors like one of you. They got in a huddle and didn't say a thing and they left. About a week later, they brought a canoe over and put it down from my class. <clears throat> they just said, it's for you, for your use. So I said, well, what do you want? Do you want me to do anything for you? He said, no, they didn't know what that meant. What do you want? <laughs> and I brought that with me from where I came. Yeah. They didn't want anything. later, they, I heard some rustling outside my thatch hut, and I looked out, and they were sneaking off with a canoe they gave me. I didn't understand that, so I stepped out and I said, what's going on? I said, you no use. It's true, I didn't use it. So they took it back. Of course, I was a little confused, but I got to understand all that later. And they were sane in many ways, saner than we are. I wanted you to understand that, that people reflect their culture. If people have access to the necessities of life without servitude, debt, barter, trade, they behave very differently.
joined the clan? The Ku Klux Klan. Years ago, and there was about 32 members. So I joined them by talking. First, that leader said to me, what do you think of the Ku Klux Klan? And it's a great idea, but it doesn't go far enough. Then they listen. But if you get down it, they don't listen. You understand? Yeah. You, understand? you have to learn different people's values and speak in their terms, not your terms. If you speak ahead of the terms of people, they don't know what you're talking about. But if you use language, scientific centrifugal force, geomagnetic fields, they don't know what the heck they're talking about. Did you turn around the clan, though? Oh, yes. You want me to tell you how? Yeah. Okay. That was a longer process. What I did is I spoke to the leader only, took him to my lab, showed him a lot of interesting things, and he said in his southern accent, will you come on down to the clan meeting and talk to our boys? I said, they wouldn't listen to me, Lou. He said, I'll get him to listen to you, because what you say makes sense. I showed him a lot of things he never knew existed. So he silenced them, and I spoke to them a little bit. Then I said, Lou, you can look at a person, tell us all about him. How do you do that? He said, well, I didn't think I can teach you anything. I said, well, if you can do that, tell me how it's done. So I brought some pictures down to the clan meeting and projected them on the wall. And Lou said, he looks like a good man, a God-fearing man, an uh, American veteran, projecting his own values. On the end of the picture, I pulled out the bottom. It says, wanted by the FBI for subversive action against the United States. When he used to speak, he just said anything. And the others, not knowing anything, shook their head. This is the first time. What he said didn't make sense, so his group started to laugh at him. So I said to the guys, shut your mouth, because Lou knows more about people than we do. I had to defend him till the next film. The entire money structured and materialistic oriented society is a false society. Ten or fifteen years from now, our society will go down in history as the lowest development in man. We have the brains, the know how, the technology, and the feasibility to build an entirely new civilization. You believe that uh, we, we teach competition that it's not bred into some. Competition is dangerous, socially offensive, considered right and normal because you are brought up to that value system. What kind of competition did Jesus have? What kind of competition is there in your body? Suppose your brain said, I'm the most important organ, and the liver said, I am, and I want to go a free enterprise system. You'd rot away in a month if every organ of your body went out for itself. socio cyberneering does not appeal to governments, to private enterprise. We're going to do this thing. Just as the automobile phased out the stagecoach, just as television stepped in and phased out the old vaudeville and the old motion pictures, that history and technology is respecters of no society, no individual opinions, but it moves on. And we've got to be prepared to face the future. In your society, there are no mayors of cities. There, there are, are no mayors, there are no politicians, and you don't have to fill out any forms to go to the art center or music center. And you go to a university whether you can afford it or not. You don't have to use any of the system today. Let me briefly say this. You have a bumper in front of your car, behind your car. But your society, your car's hit on the side also. You have safety belts and harnesses in your car. But that assumes that you're going to hit, be hit by the rear or in front. If you're hit on the side, you go right through the side of the windshield. What good are these approaches? They are designed by men that are cerebral insufficient. You've got to design a society with a bumper all around the car, phase out human drivers, put electronic guidance systems in cars, or eliminate the automobile and design a holistic transportation system. We must put our mind to this as we do to put a man on the moon. We must put our mind to the social problem. We wish to get away from politics. We wish to get away from the old world method of solving problems. This is clean sources of power. By utilizing the natural heat of the earth, that is volcanic energy, or the magma, or the molten lava under the earth, of which there are approximately 
500 potentials. If we tap a, a mountain in Hawaii called Mount Aloha, we can get enough power to electrify the world. We can get enough power from that volcano alone. We have 500 potential volcanoes we can harness. We can use that natural heat from the volcano. No smog, no smoke, no dirt, no gases, no fuels, no oil spills, and no more burning of fuels in any city to generate power. If Japan used Fujiyama, they don't need to burn oil. They don't need oil. All of that heat is sitting there. 20 million years of power right under the Earth's surface. In fact, you don't even need to use fusion power or nuclear power. And it's easy to tap, and it's clean and available. And as soon as we make up our minds to put scientists, rather than on weapons, nerve gas, on harnessing the Earth power that is already here, it would take 10 years to change the surface of the Earth, to rebuild the world into a second Garden of Eden. The choice lies with you. The stupidity of a nuclear arms race, the development of weapons, trying to solve your problems politically by electing this political party or that political party, that all politics is immersed in corruption. Let me say it again. Communism, socialism, fascism, the Democrats, the liberals, we want to absorb human beings, women's lib, all organizations that believe in a better life for man, there are no Negro problems or Polish problems or Jewish problems or Greek problems or women's problems. They're human problems. To come into socio-cybernearing and take your part and function. We are not concerned with the divisions of segments of society. No uh, control of population? Population control is dependent upon education. We feel an educated population needs no control. You wouldn't stop sex? No, sir. Right. Good right. move, Jacques. Anytime you propose doing something that hasn't been done before, there's going to be people who say you can't do it. If everybody agreed with you, someone would have already done it. Someone already has. For nearly all of his 86 years, architect Jacques Fresco has been designing cities of the future. Fresco's structures all derive from a simple form that fascinated him as a boy. When I was about 12 years old, I was looking at a gear on a table, and I saw the cities of the future. I think all inventions are based upon experiences like that. I don't think they come out of nowhere. Fresco believes that civilization will be forced to colonize the sea if land becomes uninhabitable. The Earth can only support so many people comfortably. And if the population exceeds the capacity of the land, we're going to have to move seaward and build cities throughout the sea. Working from his Florida studio, Fresco has spent decades making detailed drawings of his futuristic ocean cities. He also builds prototypes, experimenting continually with new materials. He even lives in one. Fresco's even developed plans for transporting his structures out to sea. They'll be constructed out of modular sections, assembled on land by robots and then towed to their final ocean destinations.
other structures will be made from high-tech materials called memory metal. These memory metals can be distorted, twisted, pulled out of shape, and then when a certain temperature is provided, that memory metal goes right back to its original shape. So buildings made from memory metals can be compressed into small cubes for towing, and then snapped back to size upon arrival. And almost instantaneously, you will see a building erected before your eyes, and no humans working on it at all. Fresco's vision goes beyond architecture. He sees his cities as tools for fostering humanistic values. I feel that environment shapes our values. The people we know, the people we identify with. What will drive people in the future? A world without war, without hatred, without bigotry, without prejudice. The future must extend an invitation for all people to join in because the problems affect everybody.